Richard Doll was a real luminary of clinical research, making huge contributions to epidemiology, best known, of course, for his discovery of the link between smoking and cancer. He began that work with Austin Bradford Hill in an MRC unit and published his first paper in the BMJ, an early report, in 1950. A big paper then in 1954 of his British doctor's study followed up remarkably 50 years later, 2004, in a summary of the study with his former student and close colleague, Richard Pito. I smoked both pipes and cigarettes from 1930 to 1949 and later an occasional cigar until I learnt in 1972 that Lord Rosenheim, the president of the Royal College of Physicians, who smoked many cigars, had died of an aortic aneurysm, a disease closely related to smoking, and that he had been accustomed to saying that it was safe to smoke cigars because I did. <laughs> Since then, I have not smoked at all. We both knew the, the um, redoubtable Richard Doll quite, quite well. I remember he chaired a committee that I was on and he was 90. But this committee consisted of engineers, of physicists, of molecular biologists, of epidemiologists, of clinical researchers and so on. And I think he had us all intimidated because, quite frankly, of his superior knowledge in many of those areas. So tell me about his background. His background was very bourgeois. He, uh, he lived his early part of his life in Montpellier Square in the shadow of Harrods. Um, you know, and his father was a, a physician and it was a mixture of the traditional and maybe the exotic. His mother was a concert pianist. In 1936, he was a, a medical student and he joined the Jaro March. Uh, he told me about this man he saw putting a piece of meat into an envelope and Doll went over to him and said, what are you doing? And he said, my family haven't eaten any fresh meat for six weeks, I'm sending it home. And, this made Richard cry, you know, 50 years later. And I think it inspired in him an idea that he wanted to be a doctor, not just for the strong and the well-off, but for the poor and the people who needed him. Who was it who made the decision to study the causes of lung cancer? The MRC. There'd been an inexorable rise in, in lung cancer in this country. People had noticed it in the 1930s, but they thought it was the new ways of diagnosis that had improved, especially with x-rays. And the MRC called a special meeting in 1947, and Austin Bradford Hill came, and it was agreed that they'd have to find out what was causing this lung cancer. And Bradford Hill decided that he would bring to the study Richard Dahl, and they set off in 1948 on a case control study based around London hospitals. The study itself showed that the amount of lung cancers within the smokers was so great compared to the amount of lung cancers in the non-smokers that it led Dahl and Hill to say that smoking was a cause and an important cause of the disease. Why then did they need to go on to the famous British doctor's study? In 1950, when they published their results, it was um, received with apathy, anger and disbelief. So well, clearly we had to approach it by some other method, and the obvious method was what we call, now call a cohort study, and to try and see if we could predict who would get lung cancer. So we thought doctors would be a good population to study for two reasons. Firstly, we hoped that they might be able to take it a little more seriously, take our inquiry more seriously, and be a bit more accurate in filling in their forms. But secondly, because they would be easy to follow up, because they had to keep their name and the medical register if they were continued to practice. You know, if you were to follow a busy doctor as he makes his daily round of calls, you'd find yourself having a mighty busy time keeping up with him. Time out for many men of medicine usually means just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. And because they know what a pleasure it is to smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. The British doctors provided quite a nice natural experiment some of them didn't smoke at all. Some of them sp started smoking cigarettes when they were young and kept on smoking cigarettes all their lives. And then when the results were published in the British Medical Journal, the doctors read the British Medical Journal and thought, my God, this is serious. This doesn't just kill patients, this kills doctors. And so they provided the very nice extra natural experiment of some but not all of the smokers stopping and thereby demonstrating that although smoking kills, stopping works. The British doctors were particularly important, partly because they happened to be studied, but also because Britain was the first major country where 
a lot of young men started to smoke and kept on smoking all their lives. And so by 1970, we had the worst death rates from tobacco in the world. Now, since 1970, we've had the best decrease in tobacco deaths in the world, but that's, you know, that's quite easy to achieve if you start off with the worst death rates in the world. The publication in 1956 in the British Medical Journal showed the range of diseases that was caused by smoking. It wasn't just lung cancer, it was chronic lung disease, it was cancer of the mouth and throat, it was heart attacks. In 1964, in the British Medical Journal, there was an extremely comprehensive paper published which really detailed the range of diseases caused by smoking. So by the 1960s, and then further confirmed in the 1970s, it was clear which diseases were caused by smoking. It was clear that smoking was a major cause of death. But interestingly, when that study continued for 40 years, and eventually for 50 years, it was published in the British Medical Journal in 1994, and then the final results in the British Medical Journal in 2004, it showed that the risks were even bigger than they'd been understood to be in the 1960s, 1970s, that half of all smokers were killed by tobacco. It's extraordinary for one study to span such a long time period and to continue to yield interestingly different results at each stage. Richard and Bradford Hill were smokers while they were carrying out their study, but once Richard realised the dangers of smoking, he stopped himself. I tried digging out the death rates this morning from the year you were born, which was 1912. I mean, your parents can't really have expected you to be standing here and lecturing at the age of 85. <laughs> you know, you had about a 5% chance of still being alive at this stage. So I'm glad that you actually bucked the odds. So today, those people who gave up because of reading Richard Doll's 20-year investigation of British doctors, or 40-year, or 50 years, those people really owe their continuing health and their lives to Richard Dodd. But the, uh, the new world, of course, is where the deaths are going to happen. In retrospect, when we look back on the 20th century, the total number of people killed by smoking was about 100 million. 100 million people worldwide were killed by smoking. This century, if people just keep on smoking the way they are, with no further increase, we've got 30 million new smokers every year then we're going to finish up with 1,000 million deaths from smoking this century. The media were, of course, against us for a long time, uh, and whenever they announced a, a new observation on the harmful effects of smoking, as likely as not, the man that announced it would be smoking a cigarette, or they would have someone else get up from the tobacco industry and say, well, it's controversial, somebody else doesn't believe it. I think in later life, when he began to see how tobacco companies were beginning to exploit virgin markets, as it were, I think this did anger him. According to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Why not change to camels and see what a difference it makes in your smoking enjoyment? And he was prepared to go to the United States of America and face the venom of tobacco lawyers. It wouldn't be a thing that anybody would want to do, and I saw Richard doing this in his 91st and 92nd year, but I think when Dole walked into a room, um, you sort of had to be on best behavior. You certainly couldn't think in a woolly way in front of him. The body language would change, and the extraordinary thing about Richard is that he really listened to what people said, which is unnerving. People are not used to it. So when you talked to Richard, he really engaged you. And if you were saying something that was in any way a waste of his time, you knew your time was up. <laughs>